So you begin your book by drawing a, an example of the kind of um, Siamese twin connection, joined at the hip connection between weapons and nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, well, I went back and I um, looked at old archival um, New York Times articles about the development of um, nuclear um, weapons and also the development of um, nuclear energy. And many of the atomic scientists who were involved in the Manhattan Project didn't even believe that nuclear energy was safe um, because of the problem of residual heat and containment. So there was a lot of, um, you know, dissensus about whether nuclear energy would ever be safe. But the Atomic Energy Commission um, pushed forward, and Eisenhower, in his Atoms for Peace speech, created the kind of rhetorical um, rationalization for how the atom that was used in weapons could be transformed as a peacekeeper by ensuring energy security. Because energy security is a cause for war. Um, Japan, for example, has historically not had energy security. And one of the reasons that they lost in World War II is they were running out of energy. They were running out of access to oil. So there was this utopian idea that if we had energy security, then war would be irrelevant. And that idea was deliberately promoted by Eisenhower and others. At the same time, there was a clear recognition by the powers in the, in the world that if you had nuclear and had the capacity to develop a nuclear weapon, nobody would invade you because you would have the power of nuclear deterrence. And so countries like India, on the surface, embraced the idea of the peaceful atom, but they used the um, uranium from their civilian plants to produce their first nuclear weapon. So from the very beginning, there was this intimate connection, and when countries pursued the peaceful atom, oftentimes they were also pursuing it in order to have the capacity to build nuclear weapons that would give them the deterrent power. And the capacity for nuclear to provide indefinite energy was never realized. Um, I believe that Helen Caldicott, among others, have, have demonstrated pretty conclusively that when you look at the entire energy cycle, what it takes to mine uranium and you know what it takes to decontaminate a, a nuclear plant after it's been closed down like San Onofre that that nuclear is very energy intensive and it's not carbon neutral at all and that this idea that it's going to provide energy security is a unsubstantiated fantasy but it's a convenient one um, and it provides the rationale for countries that want to have that nuclear deterrent power. And Japan uh, definitely wanted to have this nuclear deterrent power because it, it, it doesn't have a lot of friends in Asia. And so it was pursued very aggressively in the post-World World War II context, and it became a great market for um, reactors that were being sold by the UK and by also the United States and General Electric in particular. And lurking there on the other side is this nuclear deterrent capability. Now, Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution prevents any act of war. And so the nuclear weapons deterrent capabilities had to always be kind of understated and in the background. But you can tell that it was there because Japan very, very aggressively pursued enrichment and reprocessing of uranium and started stockpiling plutonium. Mm -hmm. And there has been this fantasy in the nuclear industry that you could take nuclear waste and, and, and every fuel rod that has been spent, there's a certain amount of plutonium that remains, and that you could take that and refine it and enrich it, and then you could recycle it 
in specially designed re reactors that will burn plutonium, and Japan pursued this, these bre breeder reactors um, that could run on plutonium and that would help them recycle um, all the fuel from their boiling water reactors. But the breeder reactor programs had been closed in, in France, in the UK, in the United States, because plutonium is very volatile and very difficult to control. And Japan alone um, did not close the system, and they started acquiring more and more stockpiles of plutonium. And they also were purchasing plutonium um, from other countries, from Russia, for example, and there was plutonium that belonged to Japan that was stored in France and, and also the UK. So Japan was stockpiling all this plutonium. And many people have expressed concern about this because Japan is the only country in, that doesn't have quote unquote nuclear weapons um, that stockpiles plutonium. And there have been concerns about this since the 80s. So this is not a, a, a new concern. There are many people who have argued that Japan actually had uh, a secret nuclear weapons program. And there's no way of proving whether in fact they had that or not. But it's one thing is clear is they certainly had the plutonium on hand to be able to develop a nuclear weapon. And then they, um, in 2008, they passed the aerospace law, which allowed them to develop essentially rockets um, so they would have the capabilities of delivering a nuclear weapon. Because you could have an atomic bomb, but if you don't have the, the rockets to deliver it, it's not going to be much use to you know, nuke your enemies because they're too far away. So in 2008, when the aerospace uh, law was passed, that allowed them to develop these missiles and have them on hand. And then in 2011, um, the ban on um, exporting advanced weaponry was lifted. So they have the infrastructure. I, I, I like to think of it as they probably have a just-in-time system. You know, the Japanese are so good on just-in-time systems. So if they wanted to have a nuclear weapon, I, I doubt it would take too much work because probably the assembly line is in place and they have all the necessary um, parts. And under uh, the current um, administration, there's been a lot of saber rattling. And so this nuclear capacity of Japan is receiving more attention and more concern, particularly from countries like China. It's an implied deterrent. It is. A kind of whispered threat, I guess. It is. Yeah. But it's, it's not even that implied because, for example, the Rokasho um, reprocessing plant, which is being completed, uh, will have the capacity to produce even more plutonium. And it was discovered to be on an active fault. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of pressure to never open it, never launch it. And the LDP uh, party has said that it's vital for national security. And how can it be vital for national security if you're thinking in terms of civilian energy? It, it isn't. So there's definitely, um, within the current political climate in Japan, among many, uh, in, they're embracing this um, nuclear deterrent capability.